set the table here, Governor Hogan. I'm speaking to you before you give your speech uh, at the Reagan Library, but it's I'm, we're, we're talking here because I think we both believe that uh, you're breaking some eggs, or you hope to be breaking some eggs inside the Republican Party. Well, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Uh, and I want to you, you, I want to read you read one of your lines back at you here. The divide in our party today really isn't ideological. It's more of a difference between those who know how to win and those who only pretend that they won. Seems like an obvious reference, but explain the line. Well, look, I think um, our party's been doing an awful lot of losing and uh, an awful lot of making excuses. And, uh, and so I, we've lost, uh, we lost in the past four years the White House, the Senate, the House. We lost the uh, you know, governor's races and state legislative bodies, and I'm tired of losing. You know, Trump said we were going to get tired of winning. We're going to be winning so much, but all, all we're doing is losing. And I think um, there are people who just will say, well, the election was stolen, uh, you know, it was fixed, and... Uh, Look, it was. That's not true. Uh, you know, the, the losing candidate just didn't want to accept defeat. And we have to find a way. Uh, you know, I'm a, I would say I'm a, argue I'm a guy who knows how to win because I ran 45 points ahead of the president. The only place we've been on the ballot together, I did just as well among base Republicans and conservatives. But successful politics is about addition and multiplication, not subtraction and division. That's what Reagan did. Uh, you know, he, he, he broadened the tent. We've been shrinking the tent and, and turning off voters. And that's not the way to win. One, to me, it seems like one of your hardest challenges is going to be there's a chunk of the party that thinks what you just said about the election is, you know, oh, yeah. what do you know? You're, right. you're, 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 you're the one right. that's the conspiracy theorist. This is a broken information ecosystem yes. that you're walking into. Well, there's no question about that. And it's a big part of the problem with the toxic politics and the, the whole divisiveness in America. There's, there's misinformation and disinformation all over the place and all over the spectrum. And there, there are an awful lot of people. I understand why they feel that way because that's the information that they've been fed. I'm not questioning, uh, you know, why everybody's entitled to those opinions, but they're basing them in many cases. Look, you, people can argue that uh, perhaps there were improprieties in elections in different places. That's probably true, but not enough to overturn the will of the voters and uh, not enough to, to uh, threaten our democracy. Are you concerned that if Republicans find success this year, sort of using Trump talking points to get people to the polls, and a lot of Republicans win and they think, well, I won because I... I know, yeah. Governor Hogan, you're right, but hey, I had to appease uh, the crazies over here by telling them X, Y, or Z, and if that's how they attain power, yeah. how do you break this? Well, it's a really good question, and I think we do run the risk. I, I, look, I believe that uh, we're, it, it will be a very big Republican year. You know, there's but a, you want to win the right way, right? Don't you want to win Oscar? I want to elect the right people and win the right way. I'm afraid that we will have a huge year. Uh, Republicans will take back the House, if not the Senate, probably the, at least the House. And uh, I don't want to misinterpret that into thinking we shouldn't get uh, into a false sense of complacency because we still haven't fixed the underlying problems that have caused us to lose. We're simply going to win because the Democrats have failed so badly and they've moved so far to the left that most of America is going to swing back. This is our politics of the last decade. Yes. Is, uh, at least. I don't think when you look at all the changes we've had, when the House changes hands, the Senate changes hands of the presidency, I can't find an example where voters were voting for. They seem to be voting against. Well, the, the, it happens a lot, and that's not the way it should be. You know, it's been a while since we've done that, but it used to be. I think uh, maybe I'm uh, being a little bit, uh, you know, nostalgic, I guess. But back in the day, you would actually go out and people would vote for mm -hmm. the candidate, whether it was the Republican that there was. You actually had to make a case that you would work with the other party. Well, that was a, that was an important thing to say in October. Well, well Ronald Reagan was uh, the great communicator, but the other thing that he really did was he was his he had a willingness. You, you know, you compromise is not a dirty word, and, and willingness to cross the aisle to get things done was a good thing, and he was very successful. He had that relationship with Tip O'Neill. You don't have to compromise your principles. You still argue passionately for the things you believe in and fight for what you think is important, but you also don't have to question. Uh, you know, demean the other person or make them an enemy or question their patriotism. And that's what Reagan did. You know, he, he said your 80 percent friend is not your enemy. And, you know, you know, part of a loaf is better than none. Well, uh, we are not anywhere near that politics. Well, that's so I'm going to be speaking at the Reagan Library. And I and I, you know, I think the way the path forward is to take a look at what worked for us in the past. And I think part of that was a more civil dialogue, a more positive, hopeful message, and a, a willingness to uh, just work in a pragmatic way to solve the problems. The country's got some serious problems. 
you know, people on both sides of the extremes have very passionate agreement, uh, disagreements about it, which is okay. Mm -hmm. But we have to find a way to reach the middle, which is what I've done for eight years uh, in, in a very, uh, you know, right outside of Washington, 30 miles down the road in Annapolis, where we have the bluest state in America. Is it an ideological issue or a stylistic issue inside the party? I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, I, I really don't think it's that ideal. I think it's more, look, I, I think there are people in both parties who are more uh, interested in winning an argument on Twitter or driving up their likes or raising, you know, f a fundraising dollars by throwing out red meat to the base than they are in actually representing their constituents and fixing things and solving the problems. And that's, I think, at the, uh, that's why people are so disgusted with the divisiveness and the dysfunction in Washington. It's why nothing gets done. It doesn't matter if Republicans are in power, Democrats are in power. We still have stalemates and we still don't ever really accomplish anything. I'm going to fast forward. You're running for president. Let's say the governor of Florida is running for president. You two, uh, two have two different leadership styles. Um, it, you, you've been, you haven't been afraid to be critical of, of Governor DeSantis's leadership style. It seems to me you think that if he's the nominee or someone like him, if you're going to, that that is not a long-term good place for the Republican Party to be. Why? Well, I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to play pundit, and I don't want to speculate on who might run and, mm -hmm. and who, who, who might be the nominee. I mean, I, I, I think it's far too early. We're two years out. Uh, you know, six months is an eternity in politics. And well, we've got, in your speech, you're saying, you, know, you, you don't want a cheap impersonation of Trump. You, that we won't be back in the White House by nominating Donald Trump or a cheap impersonation of him. Well, I think what does that mean? America, obviously, but the fact that we lost everything over four years tells you that people were not happy with that. And I say, you know, we've got to find a way to appeal to a broader base, uh, base of people uh, if, we're, if we want to govern. We have to convince people that we have the best ideas. You don't do that by, you know, just, uh, you know, you're fighting about things and, and just firing up the base, but, you know, not reaching across to, to, to get those swing voters. We're going to win by appealing to the swing voters. And, uh, look, I think it's far too early. Um, I think there are probably 15, 16 people that may end up running for president. Yeah. And I think they're all going to be trying to fish, for the most part, in the same pond uh, for the same voters. And, and your idea is not to And do I that. think there's another lane of people that would like to go in a different direction. Give me a race in 22 that will tell you that your theory of the case is correct. Well, I mean, I think that... Uh, I, for, as an example, Brian Kemp in Georgia, I mean, President uh, Trump, I mean, he's a, he's a conservative guy who uh, you know, supported Trump, but he, he simply wouldn't violate the Constitution and throw out the results of the election. So Trump was attacking them and him and con convinced uh, uh, Purdue to run against him in a primary after he already cost us the two Senate seats. Now he wants to cost us a governor's race. But Brian Kemp is going gonna, is gonna to win handily walking away in a primary uh, this month. But if he loses the general, uh, is Trump but, right or is... Or was Trump the reason he lost? I the think general? that the reason, the reason we lost the two Senate seats and the Senate was 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 Trump directly. And I think if we lose that seat in Georgia, which I don't believe we will, mm -hmm. it will that will also be his fault. Define Larry Hogan conservatism. Forget I, you know, if you're the Republican nominee um, or someone like you, what is Larry Hogan conservatism 2024? Well, you know, I'm a lifelong kind of common sense conservative, and I, I, I would say I'm from the Reagan wing of the Republican Party. I think there still is one of those. It's more uh, tr traditional. I think we ought to, you know, I, I, I'm focused on more on economic issues than fighting every social issue that's out there. I've dramatically turned our state around. We went from Your 40. The party loves the social issues. Well, they do, but uh, they also have been losing a lot of elections. I won in Maryland by focusing on things people cared about. The people were, our taxes were too high. Our economy was 49th out of 50 states. We were losing businesses and jobs, and 48% of the people in Maryland wanted to leave the state. It, they were calling us the California of the East, and they, they didn't mean it as a compliment. And I've turned it around. We had the biggest economic turnaround in America. We've cut taxes eight years in a row by $4.7 billion. We, we went from a $5.1 billion deficit to a $2.5 billion surplus. Um, you know, I, I, I was, uh, you know, was tough on crime. Uh, we, when, when they talked about defunding the police, I was the first one in America to do just the opposite and put more money in state and local police and to stand out, speak out strongly against that kind of dangerous, you know, uh, rhetoric from the left. Uh, you know, when we had the riots break out in Baltimore for 89 days after I was governor, I rea reacted unlike anyone else, not the president, not any other governor or mayor. I declared a state of emergency, sent in a thousand additional police officers and 4,000 members of the National Guard and kept the people of Baltimore safe, which is why I have an 80% approval rating in Baltimore. So you, 
you really think you can get a nomination and avoid the social issues? I don't know that I can get the nomination, and I don't know that I want to get the nomination. I have never really said to a soul that I was interested in running for president. There are a lot of people you are speculating. A, you don't make a speech at the Reagan Library because... Well, because you just want to see Air Force One. Well, look, I, you know, I was the leader of the National Governors Association. I've been on the executive committee, the RGA. I've been involved in the party since I was 10 years old, far before I became eligible to register to vote. I was a chairman of Youth for Reagan, a young Republican president. You know, I've been, I've been trying my best to, to work in the Republican Party my whole life. And I'm very concerned about the direction of the party and the country. And I think I have a voice that's needed. And uh, they asked me to come out and speak mm -hmm. about the party. And I'm, I'm honored to be able to do it. Uh, but uh, you know that doesn't that doesn't mean uh, you know I don't I, I'm more concerned about uh, rather than just being focused on my future mm -hmm. in the Republican Party I'm I'm focused on making sure there's a future for the Republican Party. It seems that there's a new I used to say the Republican Party was a less government party. This version with Trump seems to be about strong government, not actually big or small, but in some cases using government to make a political point like well, Disney. Sure. Would you ever Would you ever target a company? Well, no. I, look, I, I, I'm not sure what the Republican Party really stands for, which is why I want to help define what I think. You don't think it is a definition think, right now? I, th I, think, I think the Democratic Party's you know, lost their footing and doesn't know what they stand for either, and I don't think the Republican Party does. Uh, I thought, I, I, I spoke, I said right away, I thought it was a mistake. Uh, you know, regardless of, of what your feeling was on the issue, and I don't know exactly what the, what the law was or what was going on and, in South Florida with respect to education, but uh, to say uh, your largest employer right. is not should not be able to express their own opinion about that and to say if you disagree with me I'm gonna punish you and raise taxes by two billion dollars and take out you know cost people potentially their That's job. That's not Larry Hogan conservatism? That is not my kind of conservatism and it doesn't seem to be like traditional Republican values. How about this growing isolationist wing in the party? What do you make of it? Well, I don't think that's a good idea either. I think, uh, look, I, I, I want I want America to, I, I, you know, I think we, you know, working on trade issues is really important. Being in isolation is not the answer. I re going back to Reagan, you know, Reagan used to stand uh, up, you know, for our allies and stand up to our enemies, and we were the country that everybody looked to. We were a beacon around the world of uh, freedom and democracy. And I, I, we're not anymore. I mean, and, and, and neither the Democratic Party or the Republican Party is mm -hmm. something with that. Is there anything, what, would you be doing anything differently than Biden is right now with Ukraine? I was, uh, I, I was very supportive of uh, what was going on in Ukraine. We've taken a lot of actions with, with the other governors and things we were doing in Maryland. But I thought he was slow to react. Mm -hmm. I thought, look, I don't think we should be putting troops on the ground, but I don't think we should have taken you know, a month or two to make some of the decisions, I would have probably quickly made all the decisions to give them every bit of military aid and equipment we possibly could uh, that we had. We should have. So your issue is speed, not necessarily the policy. Well, I think we should have taken all the economic sanctions faster. We kept saying, well, now we might do another sanction. And then a few weeks later, we might well, now we might think about more. It's like, why do you still have any left? Why haven't you taken them all? And why? Well, now we might send them these arms and this help. Why didn't you already send it to them? So it was there. I think we've just got to. You know, we, we've got to stand up for freedom and democracy in the world, and the, I, I'm, it, it's an incredible. Zelensky is a, a terrific leader who's united not only his people, but yeah. united NATO yeah. and people in America to say, we've got to stand up to this aggression by Putin. And your stance with China? China is, a, is our, probably our biggest threat. And I think, uh, you know, we've, uh, we, we've got a situation where, you know, China is... Uh, is something that we've got to figure out a way to deal with, and they're outsmarting us in many ways. And I think in some cases they're stealing our intellectual property. I think they're, you know, siding with some of our enemies throughout the world. And um, you know, I'm not sure what the exact uh, answer is, but I think we've got to be, we've got to maintain the, the relations with them, trying to figure out a better strategy. But mm -hmm. weakness is not the way to deal with China. I know you're pro-life. Is there room for pro-choice Republicans? It doesn't look like it right now. Well, you know, so I, I'm, uh, I, I think that there's uh, you know, certainly that most of the people in the party are pro-life, but I think that there, uh, there are different levels of, you know, well, you know, can we have reasonable restrictions? You know, should, should states have the right? Should people be able to make those decisions and referendum as, as opposed to others who say, you know, we're just going to make this the, the issue. Should a, woman have, away a, the rights of should women. a woman have an access to an abortion wherever they are in this country? Well, so I, my position in Maryland um, was that, you know, I have a personal opinion about abortion, but I, I didn't take any steps and said I wouldn't take any steps to overturn the will of the voters, the decisions, the laws of the, that were on the books already. And I haven't done that in eight years. So, uh, you know, I, th I don't think this is the right issue.
issue for the Republican Party be, to be making, and I don't think it's uh, it's really smart politics. I think people are really ought to be focused on uh, inflation and the economy and crime and education. Um, and if you uh, uh, if you decide um, if you do end up deciding to run, um, does Trump factor into the decision at all? Does he make you more likely to run if he runs, or le- if he doesn't run, do you walk away? Is is he? How much is he and his sort of influence on in the party motivating you right now? Well, it's a great question. I, you know, it's, it, there are two different paths. One right. is Trump's going to run, and one Trump's not going to run. They're two entirely different, uh, you know, situations, but. Quite frankly, I think I'll make a decision based on whether I believe that uh, you know I have something to offer, that, that I believe that there's a path to victory, that it's something that I decide and my family decides is uh, the right thing for me to do after I finish my term as governor in January. But wouldn't wouldn't matter to me whether Trump ran or, or not. It would be a different kind of race. Uh, but I, I think if Trump ran, very few people would challenge him. Um, I'm not sure I would be one of the ones that were shrinking away from that. Uh, but if he didn't run, I think it's a wide open race with 15 or 18 people, and I think there's a big lane that's not filled. You've uh, you've had pretty good success beating back cancer. Tell me about it. Uh, where where do things stand? You know, I'm, I'm completely uh, cancer free and have been for quite some time. What, is, what year are you on cancer free? I'm, I'm now uh, so I'm now seven years out, or well, seven years from you know from when when I, So that's great. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm free and clear, and it's uh, wonderful. Uh, you know, so I I got serious, advanced, aggressive cancer. Five months after becoming governor, and battled that with, you know, for for quite a while. But uh, other than you know losing my beautiful uh, TV hair, my gray hair, uh, I, everything else, I'm healthier than ever. You feel healthy enough to run? I do. I've got more energy than I probably had ten years ago. If it wasn't for Donald Trump's politics in 2022, would you have been a candidate for U.S. Senate? No, I, I don't think I would. It really had nothing to do with Trump or his politics. It was really. I just didn't see myself as a legislator, and I know being a member of the Senate is an important job. It's just not one that I'm well suited for. So I've run a, I've been in the private sector running businesses my whole life, small businesses. I now run the state where I make decisions every day that impact people's lives. The idea of being part of the divisiveness and dysfunction and arguing with 99 people all day and getting nothing done just didn't really appeal to me. Yeah, talk to the ex-governors in the Senate. Exactly. They all miss. They, <laughs> they all, miss all love being, being governor. governor. They don't like being in the Senate. And they all want to be called governor stuff. It's true. It tells you everything you know. <laughs> governor, thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Chuck. You got it.